I can't do any move. No, I, it's like if I move, it's either dark or the background. I could look at this you, like you know what it's I from would, like Miami in nineteen ninety. <laughs> what I would prefer more than you moving would be to record a, a podcast episode. Okay, I was thinking it'd be really fun. I don't, did I share with? Tell me if I shared this with you. But I was thinking it'd be really fun to hire a band or an individual from a band that I admire to write our theme song over again. Did I tell you this? No. I was kind of like idea. I was kind of thinking it'd be cool to call up Fallujah and just be like, <laughs> "Hey, do you, do you want that? You guys are my heroes. Here's a thousand dollars. Write me a ten second intro and see what see what they say i don't know you're gonna cold cold call fallujah kind of i mean i think i could get a hold of them maybe not like i'm some big shot or anything but i think if i dangled it maybe a thousand bucks isn't enough for 10 seconds what what, what do you think the price should be i have no idea i don't know i don't know about you know better than me well scott Scott carstairs if you're hearing this uh i gotta track (laughs) Check with your name on it. Nick, what do you say we get right into the show? Let's do it. What are you drinking? That's a really good question. Instead of starting the show, let's talk about that. I'm calling this Bob Chico, even though it's Topo Chico. Uh, I'm, I'm a weirdo. I make up names for everything. It's a flavor Topo Chico sparkling water. You know, I guess I'll apologize in advance because I will be burping. Yeah, I almost grabbed one and it's so (laughs) aggressively bubbly, I decided not to. This is the worst thing to do for a podcast, but let's get into it, Nick. Today I wanted to talk about leather care, shoe care, maybe create, and this is probably an egotistical thing to say. I want to create the ultimate leather care guide right now on this podcast. It's very ambitious of you. Do you think we're capable? Honestly, no. I, I don't know if, because my fear in the conversation we're about to have is that there are people that are certainly more knowledgeable than us in that specific realm. So my fear is that no matter what we talk about, we will omit something, perhaps get something wrong. And the more and more I've been thinking about this, because this podcast is uh, has been pending for a bit, the more I think about it, the more I realize that there's kind of no rules. <laughs> so there's like this is like a full gray everything area. So I suppose the best way to approach it might be to consider just from our individual experiences. What do you say? Yeah, we started we started talking about this. I did, I did a little bit of poking around just to sort of see what the general feeling out there in the world was. And then, you know, I've gotten tons of questions over the years about what to do and how to take care of stuff. And then I talked to a few people that are in the know or like make, you know, leather care products. And the, the thing that I got that took away from all of it is that when you talk to somebody that they tend to have a lot of information in a very specific area. So, I mean, like they know a lot about the exact thing that they work on, but when I was looking around at leather care, like a lot of the stuff that comes up when you Google is like how to take care of your car interior, which like, I just like, couldn't be bothered with. <laughs> like, I just don't like, it's just not, I'm just not interested. I mean, I, I'm, it's important I to some people, I guess, but I mean, I'm, I, when I think of leather care, I always think of, I think of like shoes and sporting goods and like bags and wallets and stuff. Cause that's just what I'm familiar with. And then I just don't even really have good recommendations for, I mean, I have, I guess I, a more informed idea since I know about leather, but, but, um, but yeah, so I'm sure to your point, I'm sure we will, someone will say like, well, if I did that to this thing, I, you know, it would, I'd strip all the dye off and then it would be useless. So yeah, we'll, we'll, I guess is that a disclaimer up front? Yeah. I love it. Maybe yeah. we can start. I would like to know the people you spoke to, but perhaps before getting to there, I, I'm kind of more curious about you. you know, how do you, let's set the focus on shoes. Do you have a shoe care regimen? I mean, nothing specific. I, I talked to, one people I talked to is my dad, just like just to see what he... You immediately skipped over yourself. 
Oh no, I'm, I'll come back to myself. All right, all right. I'll come back to myself because I have my own ideas and my own my, my own preferences. But I want to talk to him because I'm just curious. I mean, he has his own ideas and preferences too. And I mean, I worked with him for a long time, so a lot of the stuff I know I learned from him. But the the takeaway is that like, there's no. I mean, there are sort of some like rules of thumb, but there's no like, oh, this is the best product because people want their stuff to look differently. Not everyone wants their stuff to look like everybody else's stuff. I mean, some people want a mirror shine, some people don't. Like, I don't really like a mirror shine on really anything. Um, but some people, you know, that's they want on like a calf, like dress shoe. Like, that's what people really want. Some people, so so I think that it's hard to know. It's hard to know. It's hard to recommend what to do and what's best because you just don't know what people want. But I mean, I just, you just sort of have to go. I mean, I guess you have to remember at the beginning of that all that leather is just skin. So you're kind of, kind of just like, think about it. Like, like you're taking care of yourself. Like you wouldn't put, like you wouldn't put a gallon of lotion on your skin. Like at a certain point, it's just not doing anything. It's just going to feel gross and get dirty and it's just kind of useless. So you like just have to put, the enough on, which is like, how do you qualify what enough is? But I guess just with experience and then, and then, um, you know, you, you get to a point where you like what you have, how it looks. But for me, I mean, I like 90% of my leather care is just like with a damp suit, so like a soft, damp cloth and a good brush. I mean, that like t- takes care of like almost everything. I mean, when stuff, when leather starts to get really old or you get something that's older, like things get a little bit more, involved i think because you need to think about how it's been stored and what it's been used for and how old it is and if it's dry or whatever that is but you know you've got a piece of something and it's five years or less old i mean chances are it's is and as you've taken a reasonable care of it it's probably not going to need a ton of outside input unless you're trying to change the appearance why is that why five years oh it's just that was just like a like a totally random mm-hmm. well it's like a totally i mean no, I just because you know, if unless it's like been in a window, like in the sun, or it's been you know really hot or really cold or gone through the extremes often. I mean, leather is designed to be to last for a long time and to be resilient. So, um, yeah, I mean, unless you're trying to like waterproof something, I mean, there, there's a there's a bunch of different ways. I mean, again, there's no like there's no that five-year number is like, it's kind of useless. Well, I, I was asking point. about that specifically because one of the mantras I seem to have, because this question comes up for my customers, they'll buy an expensive wallet from me and they want to make sure that that wallet lasts a long time. <clears throat> so the mantra is like, kind of like, don't do much to it. And the, and the reason that I say don't do much to it is because the tannery has gone through a lot of effort to make sure that that skin and the fibers in the skin have been properly nourished and tanned with different waxes and oils. It, it was treated in a very specific way for a reason. I was wondering if you think in five years is like, hey, maybe some of these oils and waxes have sort of lived their performative life. Um, no, I was, I mean, not, not with stuff from us, I don't think. I, I was just sort of thinking like in the wider world in general. Uh, I mean, with, I mean, I've got shoes that were my grandfather's that are, I mean, my, all my Indies are, my Indies are like 20, I mean, at least 20 years old at this point and they're fine. Like I haven't put a ton of stuff on them. I mean, I've definitely conditioned them a fair amount, but not, not nothing crazy. And, And I've come across stuff in, in boxes that's old. I mean, I was looking just, just today, I was looking through my like wallet archive box. And I pulled out that little uh, shell cordovan cigarette case for like <laughs> that was made for filterless cigarettes. And you know, it's this tiny little glued case, and it's got a little card in it that says nineteen forty seven, I think, inside. And it's fine. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, it's not like it's not a, a pair of shoes, so it's not getting crazy. You know, it's not, not getting flexed, and it's been stored pretty well. But I mean, that's that leather looks fine and it's that old. I mean, I don't think that's always the case, but, um, but just to say like across the board, that there's a certain expiration date on something I don't think is correct either. Yeah. I guess if you were to break it down, it's kind of, kind of like thinking what's in these shoe polishes and what's in the leather. Perhaps it's par- something like paraffin wax. And if I had a bar of paraffin wax sitting there, if 
behind me for 80 years, it's probably not going to change very much. So is, am I on the right mindset there, you think? Yeah, I think so. I think it depends on what's in the leather and, and or, or what, you know, what waxes are, are in it. And yeah, I mean, there's, with, as with anything, I mean, we're trying to, trying to preserve it as much as possible and add things that are not perishable in it, but you put things in it. I mean, even like lanolin, like is still a natural crease. So, I mean, it's still, it's still going to change over time. I mean, it's much more, it's much more stable than, you know, what's in the hide to start with, but it's still, it's still going to change over time. So sure. it's just, it's, it's hard. I mean, cause, and you think about like even, even uh, like what a pair of shoes goes through in Chicago versus like, I don't know, St. Louis, which aren't even that far apart. It's, it's different because the weather's a lot different. I mean, there's, you know, the salt on the streets is, you know, there's more salt here than there as a general statement because it snows more here, but you know, it's just, it's just, it's tough. It's just like, you know, I mean, that's, that's why there are so many shoe care guides and like so many people making recommendations on what to do with shoes in general. And we're just adding ourselves to the mix. I, th I think what's going to be frustrating yes. for people is either they've come across this video on YouTube, which by the way, thanks for checking it out on YouTube. Everybody in podcast land that's clicked on this might also have the same feeling where they want the ultimate guide for, for leather care. And then we're going to like, eh, this kind of depends. And you know, like where do you live? Like let's maybe get to some specific potential examples. I mean, maybe that aren't specific to us, but Oh, by the I way, mean, I, we can, yeah, we can do like a very general, I mean, I can, I can, we can say what we do, like what you do and what I do. I mean, I, I, I like the results that I get from what I do. I'm not sure. I can't say it's going to be perfect for everybody, but it's definitely a good, a good starting point. I think. Yeah, I see you're wearing a hoodie and maybe yeah. jeans or something. I'm wearing like black jeans. Uh, yeah. And I think for our style, which we are apparently <laughs> very similar I do the same thing. I just, I kind of don't do much to take care of my stuff. And, and when I put up pictures and videos about my boots, people get pretty mad at me for not, not like taking care of them. Um, so I don't know if I'm necessarily wrong, but I do feel some, uh, like a good amount of shame coming at me. So I think we'll probably get blasted uh, for this. Uh, let's start with this. One thing that comes up a lot that I get criticized for is lack of shoe trees. Are you a shoe tree and everything all the time guy? No, no, it oh, depends shame. on the shoe. It depends on the shoe. Shame. Like I've got some, I've got some shoes that definitely I would not store for a long time without trees because they're just, they're softer and they start to collapse. But especially newer, newer stuff that's firmer. I mean, it tends to stand up pretty well. And yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think that trees are good. I think that if you can put trees in everything, it's not, that's a good, that's a good thing. Certainly wouldn't hurt. Yeah. I was gifted a, uh, by the way, gifted from my brother, Matt. Thanks, Matt. A gift, uh, a gift of some Grant Stone shoe trees for Christmas this year, which was very nice of him. And uh, they're already in another pair. So I think I have like three pairs of shoe trees and like 40 pairs of shoes. So that's, that's the other kind of problem. <laughs> I'm too cheap to buy all the shoe trees. Um, yeah, I'm not against shoe trees. I'm just kind of lazy. And like, I haven't, I've noticed I'm getting the results I'm happy with without them. So I, I kind of am not overly excited about shoe trees with the, with my care routine. It's similar to yours. I will say that on things that are Chrome Excel or not Cordovan brushing gets me most of the way on the, on the Cordovan, you know, I, have a workshop where we have tons of different polishes. I still don't even use them and I sell those things. So, you know, if you, if you want to buy some polish, you can buy it from me, but honestly, like you probably don't need it. So I would, I would say if you're trying to achieve a result, you might, you might want to envision what that result is first and then find a product to, to match it. So for me, like on Cordovan, I just do a damp cloth and brush the snot out of it. And that gets me really far. It even fills in scratches sort of miraculously. And then on the, you know, if some of my pairs like your indie boots and, and my indie boots are now getting over a decade old, I will condition those. Um, it, I don't go too easy on my stuff, uh, especially those indie boots I have in mind. I was wearing while working at the Dirty Smelly Tannery. So they get pretty dirty and I wash them. 
and I would use soap when washing them. And one, one of the things that I think people might miss is the conditioning aspect after washing, especially with a soap or surfactant or something that's going to break down the, the fats that are tanned in the skin. You got to you gotta condition it in the same way that you might want to use lotion on your hands after washing your hands or you know conditioner in your hair after using shampoo. Uh, you need to sort of restore some of those fats back into the into those fibers. Um, so I think that's valuable. I will do like a, say like a pint of water, cold tap water and like a drop of dish, like just regular dish soap, kind of mix it up and I'll just wash my boots with a soft cloth. The most important thing that I've learned from this process is from your tanner, Nick, Chris Kolblinger. And this came from me trying to remove salt stains from boots. And he said the most important part, he didn't explain why, but the most important part from his explanation was to make sure that they air dry naturally overnight and completely. And he said, make sure to not attempt to expedite that drying process. Are you aware of any reason why he might have said that? Uh, like move a little bit of moving air is okay, but heat is not good. I mean, people, because it, it's just, it's just, it, it's just safer to not. I mean, I think that, I mean, we use in the tannery, we use, we certainly use heat in some of, with some of the leather and then, and well, in a lot of leather drying processes, but I mean, there are, and I think we've talked about it before. I mean, there are certain, certain leathers that don't respond to heat at all. Um, what do you mean respond? So when I say it doesn't respond, well, I mean like the, the cordovan in particular and the veg tan stuff in particular just is not, doesn't tolerate heat and you start, you can, cause it just doesn't have the resistance that something that's, that has chrome or, you know, a mineral introduced into the tanning process or during the tanning process does. So just, it's just safer to just not use any heat when you're drying at home. Cause you just, you just avoid any potential issues that way. I mean, the, the, um, sort of the, the, the potential consequences outweigh the benefits for sure. Um, I should revisit that question with Chris because it, and this was a while ago, so I might be misremembering, but I recall that that his sentiment was mostly about removing those salt stains had something to do with air, like naturally air drying it, and not not introducing mm -hmm. heat. I don't. I, there might be something there. I don't know. We should revisit that and present that to yeah. the audience here. Um, but certainly, after using any soaps, um, you're going to want to use conditioner. And I, I'm stumbling there briefly because there is saddle soap. So people should be aware of saddle soap. And saddle soap is a soap, but it also has conditioner in it. So it's like, uh, I can't think of a good example of a shampoo, but it's like a shampoo conditioner combo mix, right? It's That's what saddle soap is. You can use it and it's fine. And I've used it. It's, it's I like it. I like the ability to control my own conditioner, which is the reason I don't choose saddle soap. Um, so people should be aware. Like I think cleaning and then conditioning and brushing might get people um, a little bit, bit of extra life out of some footwear and while still giving some, um, you know, nice aesthetics, uh, for example. Like sometimes, you know, if you get mud on it, it might not just come off with a little water, although it likely will. I've noticed that, that the soap helps a significant amount, but I don't do that depends on the footwear and how much I wear it. I probably don't even do that maybe once a year max. And it's very mild soap. Um, you with me on that? Same thing? Yeah, I'm with you I'm with you on that. Yeah, I think with this with the soap, I mean like a soap has like two sides of it and one side grabs onto water and the other side grabs onto like dirt and fat or whatever else. So it's it's when you rinse the soap away, it's taking with it you know, the dirt and everything else, but it's also taking with it some of the greases and oils, which is why if you wash your hands a ton, like your hands start to dry out from the soap. Um, so yeah, I think that depending on like how much soap you use and how often, but I mean, water does just plain water does that too, to a, a much lesser extent. So you definitely, definitely need to condition after, well, you don't definitely need to, but I would say generally you should, you should do some sort of conditioning after a deep cleaning like that. Once, I would say once it's dried, I would wait until it's dry. 
before um, trying to condition it. Because if it, if the leather is wet, it's not gonna it's not gonna want to take in the oils because you can't you know you get water and oil can't be in the same place at the same time. So definitely wait till, wait till it's dry first. I have a pro tip on on that topic as well. There there is such thing as over conditioning or over basically too much product on the leather will create a result that you might not like and likely won't like. Essentially, think of it, a, me a metaphor would be something like a sponge that can only hold so much water. And if you keep pouring water on that sponge, eventually the water is just going to roll off. The same thing seems to be true for leather where it will only hold so, so much substance. So if you're applying conditioner, there's only so much conditioner it will take. And eventually that leather will start to appear like conditioner and also feel like conditioner. Same with a, you know, a, a more waxy, harder wax type of polish. It will start to look like polish. So I recall when I first started working at your tannery, I remember trying to polish up some, I don't even remember what type of leather. But I was like, oh, okay, well, if I keep adding Venetian cream to this thing, it's eventually going to get like crazy bright and shiny, but it was actually backwards. It, it seemed to be the less I used, the brighter the luster and the more pleasant the luster that I was able to achieve. Yeah, the use the least amount that you can use like just the, the very smallest amount that you can that you can use to get to the result that you want yeah because it ends up it ends up getting saturated and then it'll sit up on the surface and collect dirt or salt or whatever and then it looks not not good and also if if you really over condition or over oil leather often that actually breaks it down faster than if you condition it appropriately. So there's like a middle ground, like a correct place that you want to be. Can you say so that again? Not, I think I, I think I was either not listening to you or <laughs> my brain broke for a second. Yeah. So if you if you really if, if you keep something saturated with oil all the time and then use it, it will break down faster than if you oil it appropriately and use it the same way. Interesting. I hadn't thought of yeah. that. I guess that makes yeah. sense. It just flexes more. Yeah, it's more flexible and all the fibers are more, are like almost too lubricated and move around more and start to get looser and further apart. And um, this is probably it's very something. common in the equestrian uh, world, I've been told. I was, the, I was thinking you got that from your retanning drums that have like letting out the, the skins too much. And uh, like if you over, over fat liquor, don't they sort of break down a bit? Yeah, that's more from that would be more in that in that scenario would be more from like temperature and runtime. I think is the, is the danger because there's that's so formulaic at that point where it's you've got. I took us down a bad path here, Nick. <laughs> no, no, it's my fault. I thought. Yeah. I thought we might be trying to draw analogies from tanning to uh, like sort. Yeah. Of no. I mean, I guess. I mean, I guess. I mean, that would be a failure. That would be a failure. Um, a procedural failure failure at the tanning level. So that I think that would be a whole different that would give you a whole host of problems like color and temper and everything. It, gotcha. it would be a, an issue. Uh, yeah. So, so no, um, I, I've been so here's some other learnings that a, a customer helped inform me on. I used to call the the Tanner's Blend conditioner that that I sell. I used to call that a, a non wax conditioner. I was using some words like that, but turns out lanolin is actually a wax but it is a very, very soft wax. So I think my suspicion is harder waxes give you brighter luster and softer waxes give you less bright luster or perhaps no luster. So something like a paraffin will give you a bright shine and, and uh, lanolin not so much. Correct, Amundo? <laughs> Correct. I, yeah, that's why the stuffing blends are are blends. They're not just one. You don't just stuff with just paraffin or just lanolin, because then because you, you're trying to get some of both. You want appearance, and you want conditioning, and you want something that's going to hold up and something that's going to age, or something that's going to give you water resistance, which all those kind of do anyway. But, do you know what the key ingredients are in Venetian? Um, you know that's a proprietary blend. So so no. <laughs> I, t I actually, I call, I talked to um, 
Phil at CA Zos today. He was one of the people that I, I called because I just was nice, curious. Like, so what do you, what can you tell me about solvents? Because I just was curious because you, like one of the things that, that, you know, it gets, you have to use a solvent of some kind when you're making, when you're using, a, we're making like a shoe care cream. To, I mean, this is a good, this is a good transition for, or, or segue from what we were just talking about, but because if you've got lanolin and paraffin or and carnauba and beeswax and all that stuff, like you need something to sort of bind all or like blend all those together and also make them liquidy enough to apply, um, to apply evenly, you know? Um, so you have to use some sort of solvent. So I was just curious what his take was on, you know, alcohol and turpentine and like different different kinds of you know water or what you know whatever so i didn't really get a great <laughs> revealing because he's they're very he's very like protective of their formulas which i understand uh, but I, I didn't get a lot of information other than like venetian cream is a there's a petroleum distillate that they use um which is where the, i think where the smell comes from with venetian because it's got a very distinctive smell and then there's a blend of like six or seven waxes. I forget what you said, five, six or seven of different waxes that are in that, that are in that. But, and um, I think, I think that, cause I, I was trying to get them to compare it to some of the sapphire stuff, which um, he's like, that's our biggest competitor. So I don't think he was excited to do that, but, um, but he indulged me anyway. But yeah, so I think that like the sapphire stuff seems to have like a pretty, strong emulsifier in it because it's very smooth and it stays really well combined and it's really easy to control with the venetian cream i like better i think it, i just i just i like the way it, I, just, I just like overall i like it better but it's not as easy to use i don't think like it, it's a little bit it can get a little chunky or sludgy so you have to make sure you shake it before you use it and then it goes on like not quite as evenly so you just have to be a little bit more diligent in terms of making sure it goes on like really evenly and smoothly but um but yeah, as I one of the things I did ahead of this was I watched uh, one of the Stridewise videos. He has a pretty interesting comparison on natural Chrome Excel where he conditions one boo with Phoenician cream and one with the Saphir Renovateur Renovator. Yeah, and then compares it how they look then, and then compares how they look like three weeks later, which I thought was a pretty good. That was a pretty cool video. Oh, we should chat um, to, like, to Nick at Stridewise. I think he yeah. referenced us on one of his episodes. Yeah, it was it was a good, it was a well done. It was a it was a very involved. I thought he did a nice job. We should but get Nick on here, by the way. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, sorry, that'd be good. Tangent. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, but at the end of the three weeks, he's like, yeah, they're basically the same. I mean, one is we. I'll let you go watch the video, and then you'll find out what he thinks. But I like that. Basically, one is a little better at one thing, and one's a little better at the other thing. But the the, the staff your stuff is three times the price. So just make your yeah, take your pick. We we sell your Horween Venetian shoe cream and people really like it. I really like it for, I know you use it on all the Cordovan that the tannery produces, but I really like it on Chrome Excel. I think it has a nice amount of fill to it and I like the sheen. One of the, one of the negative feedback things that I hear about Venetian shoe cream is the smell, um, which like you've mentioned is that sort of turpentine scent. I liked uh, it. You get just get high on VSC. I mean, I like this. I like the smell of like gas and lighter fluid and, and all that stuff. So maybe yeah, that's the... dude. <laughs> um, how much do uh, you think Phil listens to podcasts? You know, I would, I would, I would guess not. All right, we're gonna put. Him I've on been blast surprised. Then. I've been surprised in the past, so it could be. Well, that could is. Be wrong. There's no blasting to be had for for um, CAZOs. The, no. it, there is the, the just that turpentine thing, like so. He didn't say it was turpentine. It just smells like turpentine. He said that that they've that there is like a very very small amount of turpentine in it, but they've gone. It's they've taken it almost out almost almost completely, and it's it's um interesting. It's water. A lot of stuff that they that like like the industry in general. A lot of stuff that they use now is all water based. So um, so he was saying that it's like the Venetian is mild enough that you could use it on your skin if you really wanted to and it's very a lot of stuff in it is is very natural i mean he, he again it's hard to like he won't go into like really crazy detail but um right he's secretive enough where he like won't let anybody in the building 
Yeah, I mean, he won't let me. I mean, I just <laughs> wanted to go like see see the place, but I get it. The, I think the um, other thing that Saphir is doing is adding scents. I think they add some sort of like almond extracts is our suspicion. At least yeah. in, our, in my tannery team, we're like, I think it smells good. Almondy. It smells great. So maybe, you know, maybe that's the other um, distinct difference between between those products. So you're, you're saying that the um, whatever they're using to bind everything or to break everything down and make it sort of creamy. Mm -hmm. and, and hold together plus the scents perhaps a little different i use and sell the saphir cordovan cream which i've i like that a lot the scent is great <laughs> you don't just huff that for a bit but it also has a little bit more fill uh in terms of filling up scratches in the same way you polish your car with a wax it, it tends to fill in the scratches a little bit better than venetian and i say that um while also thinking that there's been many times where there are deeper scratches that I'm not able to overcome with either product. Um, I would say harder waxes tend to give those brighter lusters, but also provide a little bit of additional fill would be you're nodding. Yes. All right. Good. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I like, think the, I'm just, the, cream... like, the funny thing here is like, I'm just saying stuff that I've seen, but I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what the truth is. So if you're not, I'm like, okay, maybe I'm maybe my notions are. No, I think that's right. I mean, the cream, the cream cordovan or cordovan cream from the Sephir. I mean, that's it's not as viscous. It's like a, it's more of like a, I don't know what would you call a consistency. It's like a it's, it's, butter, right? Like yeah, it's like a room temperature butter. It's not like you can't pour it, but like you can those the other two products we were talking about. So it's got it's it's it must have something in it that's a little firmer. Which that would make sense why you get more fill in there because you've got something that's harder. But yeah, I like that for like if someone like it, especially on new stuff like a wallet or whatever. Like if I'm if I'm sending a wallet to somebody and there's a little scratch on it, like that's a great thing to put on there and like in the very beginning to like smooth over some of those scratches yeah. from like a presentation standpoint. But we use it on every Cordovan wallet we ship. Yeah, for for that reason, it's just like it's a good. nice I mean, presentation. Yeah, it's good stuff. I think that, yeah, I mean, it's, and it's hard though. The those lines, the, the shoe care product lines are so broad. Like you get that, like you've got Venetian cream on one side, or you know the sapphire cream cordon on one side, and then you've got like the hard like paste wax that's got black dye in it on the other. I mean, it's like they're so like they're just like not even the same. Like the only thing that they have in common is that they use them on leather. So I think that it's hard to, it's hard to recommend like one company across the board for like one like oh just use anything from this company because it's all good um yeah because i heard i heard because i've heard like some you know some people like oh i like i don't like the ace waxes from this company because the pigments that they use or there's too much pigment in there and that tends to set up so i like to use this company for for that i heard i recently heard um i was talking to Going back and forth with Hillary from Edward Green, just asking if they had a shoe care guide because I think you know, their shoes are beautiful. And she said that they use Boot Black, which is a Japanese company, um, for their polishes, which is, I'm not, I know them by name, but I don't, I'm not familiar with any of their stuff. So I'm going to try to get some of their stuff and see what it's like. Oh, nice. But if okay. she recommends it, I'm sure it's at least serviceable. Yeah. I, I come across a lot of brands that make polishes and, and conditioners. And there are a lot of people that claim one is better than the other. I think you kind of get similar results with most of it from what I've seen. I wonder how much of, I wonder how many shoe care product producers there actually are. Like how many people, cause like they all private label. So like so? how many people does, how many well, people Venetian, does. Uh, the CA Zoe's doesn't. Yeah, they do. Oh, you mean yeah, private label to somebody else? That, yeah, with someone else's name on it. I like, mean, you can buy... Like yeah, well, I put their name on it, but uh like to pick on our our buddy, Brett. I don't know if he still does, but they used to send Venetian cream, like a little bottle of Venetian cream with all of their boots. And I don't think... I'm not sure they put the Venetian cream name on it anymore, but I mean, it's... I don't think he would mind me saying that that's what it is, but... um. <laughs> It's a nice touch, though, to send like a little. It's like that little bottle. I don't know if you've seen it, but I have. I think uh, he sent me a, yeah. one with my 
my pair of uh yeah whatever. so i just i wonder like people are like oh this is so much better than that other thing but i mean it's like could be from the same place well so here let's get into that a tiny tiny bit because i recall having conversation with your dad regarding using venetian cream on all the cordovan that you produce and i remember he ran a trial running instead of the venetian shoe cream he would use tanner's blend before the glazing process and i remember he was actually talking about switching over to the tanner's blend because he liked it so much so that kind of think that kind of says a lot right there it's like the conditioner is adding enough fill and luster to the glazing process of shell cordovan it's almost like you don't need a ton of anything maybe it's mostly just the water in it that's that's doing a lot of work yeah i don't know i mean i think that i mean that's an interesting example because it's so specific but yeah so we before we glaze the cordovan so all like after after it's gone through all the dyeing process like one of the last like four steps or whatever is um we put a little bit of venetian cream on the shells with a sponge and then while they're still before they completely dry or like the same day we glaze them with the you know the glass rod that's in a that's being held like in an arm in a glazing jack so it gets it's pressure and friction and the combination of those with what's in the, what's in the leather what, with what we put on the leather like that's where all the all the shine comes from or almost all the shine comes from they um, giving away all the trade secrets of shell cordovan tonight <laughs> If if that's the only thing, if that's the only piece of the puzzle that's left, <laughs> if you you've just got won. <laughs> our process figured out. Other than that, then I'll give it to you. Um, <laughs> I think to make to, to to help people visualize what that machine looks like, it's kind of like a same idea as the the deer bone that people might be familiar with, where it's just a very smooth surface pressing down on the leather. It gives you a little bit of smooth um, polish. But, yeah, it compacts the fibers. And it does it does a, a number of things, but but um. But yeah, I mean, even then, a lot of what we're doing is coming from inside the leather. I mean, it's the, because we're, we take the Venetian cream and we actually, we dilute it further. We actually cut it with just alcohol uh, to make it like really, really runny. And then that's what we put on there. So it's not, I mean, we're putting on, I mean, we're putting on less than, than would go on if we just put it, took it straight out of the bottle. But, right. And I'm not sure when. I mean, we we just do it that way because we've always done it that way. I mean, it's like... It's right, that's just, why the Tanner Splend example is so interesting. I think the problem with using too much of a harder wax polish on cordovan in glazing specifically would be too sticky, too grabby. Yeah, it's tough because something that looks on the table that looks great like that, I mean, you could once you get it into a product and it goes through the same finishing process in the you know at alden or, or whatever it could give you a slightly different a slightly different end result so it's it's not it's a uh, we don't always or i mean with cordon we never make changes to anything but um but yeah we're slow we're slow to make changes like that especially you said it might be something in the leather that's giving the luster more i wonder if it's the tree barks because i'm thinking specifically about very classic veg pit tan even like a uh, like a Rendon Bach outsole. I'm sure somebody, I'm sure a lot of people listening that are <laughs> leatherheads and leather dorks like us uh, have worn or at least seen a veg tan just straight up like natural veg belt and how bright that belt has become just with without product. And that leather is very, feels quite dry and firm to start with. So it's got to, it's got to be more than a polish that, imparts luster sure yeah i mean it's the density because the the tree barks are giving giving the density um so that i mean that's something that's denser is going to will take will polish better over time uh, naturally and then and then it's the waxes too i mean because the the rendon box stuff i don't know what waxes are in that are in that stuff uh specifically but i'm sure there's a pretty heavy blend of tallow pick any, and some pick waxes, any veg yeah. though you know could be wicked right yeah. like any pit tan natural colored veg i've seen so many different tanneries just have beautiful bright looking patina on that old veg 
So I, again, like I think part of the puzzle here is to, if you're trying to get a bright luster, it might not be all about the polish. Is what I'm trying to trying to say. Yeah, and no, I think that's right. Yeah, I have a question for you. Do you ever condition your outsoles? No. Well, your actually, leather, yeah, I your do. Leather I, you outsoles, know what I, like the I'm sorry, the bottom I do. of your shoe. I do, and I do it like on the welt. Um, but I didn't do that all until like kind of recently, like maybe three or four years ago. But it makes a lot of sense. Like, <laughs> like I probably should do that more than anything else, right? Well, it's tough because this. I mean, you're you're. Like, as soon as you start wearing a pair of shoes with a leather outsole, like you're kind of on the clock. Like you will, I guess, any soles really. You're gonna if you wear them enough, you'll wear through the outsole, and you'll need to get it replaced. So it's not <clears throat> exactly like an upper where you're kind of like the upper you have forever, like you have no option, where the bottom, at least on something that's stitched down or could be welted or similar construction, like you can change, like you have a chance to replace the bottom without really compromising the shoe. I mean, it's the shoe's designed to have that done. But I think that, especially if you get a pair of shoes on eBay or whatever, that's quite old and then has a leather outsole. I mean, one of the first moves I think would be to, to condition I mean, you condition the, the whole shoe depending on what it needs, but you're not it's you're not gonna really change anything appearance wise if you put needs foot oil on the bottom of your shoe. I mean you might like track a bunch of dirt a, into your house, but yeah. I think it'd be a great idea, right? It seemed like conditioning the, the outsole, if it's a leather outsole, might be the best idea you could do. Yeah. Did you ever talk to your grandfather about his shoe care routine or if he had one? Not really. Uh I mean he was The only thing that I really talked to him about or heard from him about was the, like the, how, like our, what I found out about him was that he was very specific with how he wanted things to look. And like, he was, he was like very, he liked the stuff to look very natural. Like he would, like the, like there's that one story about him getting a pair of shoes, a cord, pair of cordovan shoes. And he's like, it took me like an entire bottle of lighter fluid to get all of like the die off of it to make them look like correct again but that's just uh, leather tanner brain right yeah maybe yeah, we so should I mean, talk about like, that because that's an interesting thing i don't think people i don't know how they would be aware of it but shoemakers will often refinish the leather after the shoe is crafted so the appearance of the leather is much different in the shoe box than it was out of the tannery and I see that a lot. Uh, I, th I think Alden is sort of like most recognized for that in sort of our little niche here. For And apparently they do a great job at refinishing the shell. Um, so that maybe that's what your dad was like, hey, I want this to look like the leather I sent you, not like <laughs> whatever way you finished it. Yeah, that's, I mean, I have a pair of those. And I think you've, you've borrowed them before, those, those color eight. That's how I Long impressed rings. my my wife before she was my wife was with that pair of shoes. Yeah. I, I was wearing those. You let, you or your dad let me borrow them for a wedding, and that's like how I met my wife. Yeah, she complimented they're, they're, my she complimented the shoes. They're awesome shoes. They're there's awesome. a picture. There's a picture on like Instagram from forever ago, like when they were when I came across them, like in that like gigantic, super disorganized like archive cabinet that we have, and they were so like dirty and waxy and i like polished one of them and took pictures of it and it's i think it's a cool picture but i, I repost it every once in a while because it's a it's it so seems awesome. to be seems to be one that people like but but yeah so those shoes like the heel was coming off and like they had just been sort of i mean i don't know how long they've been in the cabin 10 years and i, I took them out and I, I just polished them and was wearing them and you were wearing them maybe well i don't know if it was before or after that but the heel one of the heels started to come off so i sent them back to alden and i said just fix the heel like don't even put a new bottom on them just like just just fix the heel and just send them back to me and they like replaced the sock like the sock liner which had like the cool old alden logo on it and they refinished them so they looked brand new and i was so so bummed out but then i did use most not most a quarter of a bottle of lighter fluid <laughs> to take off all of the all of the addition, the extra dye they put back on there so like grandfather uh, like grandson yeah so right. now they let, now they look awesome again <laughs> except I you mean, don't they, have that cool old uh, that old in, like insulting yeah i mean it's a lot but yeah yeah 
All right. Yeah, what about their office? I mean, it's interesting to know what like old time leather people do for their shoes. I mean, did you disclaimer, dad... don't disclaimer? Don't do that. Don't use leather fluid on your shoes. Yeah, never. So it's it's like it's gonna dry out the leather and and light your house know, on it's fire. Lighter fluid, but it's flammable. <laughs> do, <laughs> is it? Uh, what, what did your dad tell you? What he does for his shoes? Uh, he I mean he likes like the the go tos are are for him and for for me are Venetian cream and then Neats foot oil because we use both of those during processing. The um. You know, the Chrome Excel gets a coat, almost all Chrome Excel gets a coat of Neats foot oil at the very end. Um, and the other quarterman gets the, the Venetian cream or a, sort of a, a diluted version of it at the end also. So it's those are safe because those have been, we've done that for I mean, 80 years. I mean, who knows how long it's, that's been. Or so I mean, like it's a pretty tried and true, um, tried, tried and true option, but yeah, I mean, he, he tends to be pretty minimal, but he also has a lot of shoes. So I don't know <laughs> how often he gets to a point where he has to like really, really condition a pair of shoes. I mean, he's to, I mean, certainly he rushes a lot, but you know. yeah. Also, there's a, there's a union product called, I think it's called Leather Protector, which is just like such a generic thing. And it looks kind of like the cream cordovan. It's like, it looks almost like chapstick, like white chapstick. And it it's it's works really well too. I wonder, I don't know if anyone sells if you can just buy it, but um I should look into that. Maybe maybe I'll see if I can get some of that and smell sell it sell it in small quantities. It, it's very neutral smelling too. Leather protector. Yeah. All right. Maybe they'll sponsor this the show and we can <laughs> talk about leather protector. By the way, if anybody, to... any other uh, leather <laughs> leather uh, care products people want to send us money, we'll take it. Uh, have you? Speaking of getting sponsorships, let's trash and go overly critical on products. Are there any products that you super hate? <laughs> go hard, Nick. I don't know if you. Ha- I have some something in mind. I don't remember who made it, but I will. This is the word of caution I'll give to people. J- like snow seal i don't that, like snow i think seal. that might have been what it was it's that, like the word of caution is like never put a product on your shoes that say like this will make it waterproof that is the worst possible thing you could do unless it's like a rubber galoshes or something <laughs> you li- literally don't use it on anything well, water resistant certainly i mean if you add like there's open offs or like the like otter otter wax otter Something. I mean, like that stuff's fine. You just have to know what you're getting yourself into. You're you're putting something on the outside leather. It's not going to go in the leather, and it's going to be a barrier for a while. And then where the leather creases and where it gets scuffed, it's going to come off, and it's not going to be waterproof there. And then you're going to get a bunch of dirt stuck in the rest of it. So, so it's fine. There's it's fine no if, reason to use it, and it makes it look stupid and feel awful. It's terrible. So snow seal, don't send me your money. I it's don't fine. Even know I if it understand was snow why seal. people like. I understand why people like it. I think it. Has, I, I don't think it's it's has no place in this world. I just prefer other things. I'm going to hard be, to tonight, be diplomatic. Nick. I haven't slept very much recently, and I'm feeling yeah, cranky. No, I I don't anything. I tend to to gravitate towards anything that doesn't have color in it, like just neutral, because the to me the colors and the pigments that get added to the paste waxes and the conditioning creams, like they're just. I mean, when they work, it's great, but they just, they never, like the color never matches just right. And then you're changing the color in one spot versus another spot. And then there's the, you know, what's changing the color of the posh itself is, I mean, it's a, you know, a stain or a pigment or some combination of that. And then the pigments are going to sit up and they're going to get cakey and they're not going to look good over time. So Uh, there's a local restaurant that I have done some work with who make menu covers and they have this cool old, it's super I should take you there Nick. It's a it's like a cocktail speakeasy kind of vibe. Maybe the best cocktails I've ever had. Uh anybody in Chicago check out Metal Lark. It's very nice. And they have some old leather couches and chairs in their sort of like library kind of vibe cocktail place. And the owner messages me and he's like, "Hey, some of these 
leather couches and chairs are getting all scratched up and they're kind of like, can you come by and help me like clean them up? I'm like, dude, this is not what I do at all, but because it's you and I like your cocktail so much, give me, give me some cocktails and I'll do it, which Steve, you still got to pay up. Uh, but I went over there and to your point about using different colored polishes and conditioners, they never match. And that's for sure. So I had a, I actually have a Saphir, um, sort of like an Oxblood color eight type of vibe uh, that matched pretty close to this chair, but still did not match perfectly. I actually found a better result to, to sort of mix a dye myself and, and match the color and then sort of seal it off with a, with a polish that seemed to work. So speaking about leather care in this context, these were who knows how many butts have been in these seats. <laughs> this is like extremely buddy leather. Uh, but turned out like you didn't need to do too much to it other than uh, I use some of that Tanner's blend conditioner and like really it adds a depth to it and sort of makes it look lively again. But my suspicion there might be just you probably get a similar result if it was just water. However, these chairs and couches are used so much, it probably needed a little nourishing anyway. So I went ahead and did it all with that. You know, we, we only sell two ounce bottles of, of that conditioner and like a chair will eat up almost to like a big leather chair or a couch. You probably eat up a lot of conditioner. So that might give a sense of how much conditioner people might want to use in their shoes. Um, usually my advice is to start with like a little drop the size of, of a pea if you're trying to condition a shoe or a boot and you can always add more, but start real small and you'll know like when you're not sort of slicking out that product anymore, you, you'll know you need to add a little bit extra. But like you were saying earlier, just start with like the smallest you can, you can get by on. So you definitely don't want it to look like conditioner. Do you apply... When you condition, do you apply with a rag or do you use your fingers or what do you use? I get like all nasty and I just, <laughs> it's like, well, if I'm, if I'm not joking about it, I'll, I'll pour, uh, for the couch example, I might pour a good amount into my hand and just sort of like slather it with my hand. If it's, if it's a shoe, I'll actually pour like that little, little pea size onto my finger and, and sort of ease it in with my finger and then maybe expedite it with a, with a soft cloth or like an old t-shirt or something. Yeah. Yeah. That, I decide the same thing. I think if you can put it on with your hand, that that's, you get the best idea of like how much is going into leather versus like how much, because if you use like a cloth, like it gets soaked into the cloth and you don't know exactly how much is going on. And then you, when you start, you're putting more on then, you know, 10 seconds later as it starts to spread out in the cloth. Um, but I think that that's a problematic recommendation if you're using like a burgundy tinted polish like i don't think you want to put that on your fingers i mean yeah, you do but yeah, I, wouldn't. I actually was i now recall that moment i was actually wearing gloves because i was yeah. working with stains i was wearing like plastic gloves yeah um speaking of, of applying polishes and stuff i'm just thinking about my experience with with using the severe cordovan cream there's some large value i get from doing the karate kid method of the the wax on wax off so there, there is a significant difference buffing out that wax that you've applied with a dry cloth. And I think that might be most of it actually is like just getting rid of extra polish that gives you more shine because it, it gets a little streaky and it gets a little um, not sticky feeling, but it, it, it feels more like the polish than it does the leather. So maybe again to the point is like don't use too much and definitely buff out as much as you can and then give it a a brush are we vibing again yeah no i think that one of the i don't even remember if it was like style forum or ask andy about clothes it was one of those two but there was like the leather care guy that everyone the mac looks method? to for yeah and it was just, was just water like, right it was like every tw don't, like don't put anything on your shoes like every 12 wearings you condition it and then when you're done wearing your shoes like brush each shoe for 15 minutes <laughs> like it's just funny because you can't really you can't really over I mean, it was with cordon at least you can't really 
the quarter in a soft brush, you can't really overbrush it. Like you're just going to, at a certain point, it's not going to get any shinier, but you're not going to hurt it by like continue because you'll mobilize the waxes and move those around. It's and just get a little fire, hotter. Fire like the friction is yeah. heating it up a bit. One of the things I was thinking about today that I don't, that I do that I don't really think about doing very often is I have, t I have multiple brushes. So different brushes for different things. And I even, I have multiples of the same brush for dark polishes and light or not, not dark polishes, light, light shoes and dark shoes. So like I have a black horsehair brush I use on like black and color eight and dark cognac. And then I have a horsehair brush with white bristles that I use on like natural and urban and Ravello and stuff like that. You have I don't, to, I, you have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that because over time the brush starts to pick up a little bit of that color and will more and more over time. It's so mostly, it's, it's mostly important to preserve those light shades from getting dirty. Yeah. yeah. And it's not even yep. about the polish. It's about the transfer of color, really. Like right. The, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I've, I've experienced that. I mean, we've polished so much. Sometimes I'll actually mess up. And it's so it's not as sensitive as you might think, like, or as I'm sort of presenting now. It's like you can you can kind of get away with a brush, but you really can't get away with a cloth. Uh, if, you, if you're doing that buff off thing, you got to have a clean cloth for a light color. Black doesn't matter at all. It doesn't seem like cognac or color eight or cigar or any of those darker colors seem to matter at all for the brush. Um, but definitely like whiskey and natural shell or even like light colors of Latigo, natural chrome Excel have a tremendous difficulty keeping clean. Light colors are the bane of my work existence, but they happen to sell the best and I think look the coolest. <laughs> it's a shame. They change the most. Well, yeah, they change the most. Over time, they get get the most uh, reward, I guess, for your time. You were you were keen in on brushes for a second. I remember there was a moment where you had different animal hair brushes. Any insights yes. to that? Yeah, just it, it goes back to personal preference again. I think I think that more than the type of bristle, that the length of the bristle matters. Like a one inch, or like a one and a half inch horsehair brush or like a half inch horsehair brush like do they they are different so like the hog bristles or like the goat or like all those things like they're i mean goat is super soft so it's a little different but we'll break it all down yeah, so start with the length like what is the long do compared to short so lo the longer the bristle the or the hair the softer the brush is so the more gentle it is and like the more fine, I guess the adjustment is. So the generally you use a longer, I use a longer bristled horsehair brush at the very end because it's more like a finishing brush. You're bringing up like the final shine on something. And then one step past that would be like a, like a soft, like flannel, like a pad or like a, um, a cloth to like, to go even a little bit finer. And then you sort of go down, um, or earlier on, I guess, in the cleaning or conditioning process with other bristle lengths, like shorter horsehair bristles are more, you know, they're stiffer. So they, they get into the creases and the crevices more to clean stuff out um, or to like start to start off the shine. And then it starts to get even more aggressive with like the hog hair and like the peccary or even like the nylon. Some of the nylon bristles, I think, have their place too in the, especially early on, like cleaning stuff out. No concern about scratching the surface. Sure, I mean, yeah, and the, I mean, the shorter the bristles, the more, the more of a chance, there more chance for that to happen. And I think that the nylon bristles, they they break down over time, and they get they're more prone to like getting to, to scratching. But, um, but for stuff like football, um, which benefits from brushing too, I like a nylon bristle better. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, small sample size of people that are brushing yeah. footballs. For yeah, sure, well, I mean, let's tell the equipment managers for NFL yeah. teams what's up. Yeah, I mean, because that's that makes it that bring like the the thing that makes football from the football that we make interesting or compelling is that it's well one of the reasons it's sticky, it's tacky, um, so that helps with grip and. When you use something over time, it's it gets less grippy. But you can just by brushing it, it'll it'll bring up that that grippiness back to it, like immediately without that much brushing. I think it does so, it by melting the waxes. 
right? Yeah, same thing. It's just you're mobilizing the waxes and it means you're cleaning off dirt. You're cleaning it too. I and mean, whatever is in the, in, whatever is creating a barrier, you know, like you know, dirt or whatever is in between your, your fingers and the leather. I and mean, you're taking that away too, which is helping a lot also. But yeah, the I'm not going to, even we shouldn't even go down the like football equipment manager rabbit hole. That would be a, that would be a good. We should get them on. Get Wilson we in should here. Get, we should get, no, we should get an equipment manager on here. Oh yeah. That'd be, that'd be awesome. Like, cause they, they smear the footballs with like the baseball mud and then they put them in a duffel bag and leave them in the sun for two weeks and then they deflate them and then they over inflate them and then they submerge them and they put them in a dryer. I mean, it's like. I saw the shaving cream and. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not even, they don't even look, I mean, you look at, it's interesting if anyone wants to, to, to see what we're talking about. If you go to like, go to the Wilson website and just click on, uh, like look at an, an official game ball for uh, football. And then remember the, what that color. And then the next time you're watching a football game, look at the color of the ball that they're actually using. I mean, it's like dark, dark brown, and it leaves the tannery like a bur- like a light burgundy color. And they're just they're putting so much stuff on there. But references are you know what, man? That's another thing. It's I think if they only knew, I think if they just used that stiff bristle brush and brushed it and left it sort of like how you tanned it, they'd probably get a stickier ball. In the same way that if people wearing their whatever Cordovan Chrome XL any nice reputable tanneries piece of leather on their shoes, like don't do anything to it. Just let the leather be what the tannery developed it to be, you know, yeah. just brush it a little bit. Is there something there? Yeah. I mean, I think so. I mean, we put a lot of work into making it that way, but also I'm not like a professional quarterback. So it's hard for me to <laughs> say like, you don't know what you're talking about. Cause I mean, some, some of the, I mean, the word that I get is that some of them like, really smooth like they like the pebble to be relaxed because they think they get like a better release because yeah, the guy's hands are so big that it almost doesn't the stickiness at some point like doesn't even matter as much i mean to to, to you and to me it does because we don't have like oh i see quarterback sized hands same thing with a basketball i mean like we would want a basketball to be really sticky but then they if you're gonna try to palm it but those guys like they practice with the basketballs for like a year before they even make it into a game and they're totally smooth because they get a better release is the is the uh idea but um why don't you just change how you make a football then the leather i mean we could we could well we could, we could offer different options but the problem is, is there's everyone has a different idea and there's i mean people are superstitious and have different have specific ideas of what things should look like i mean the the only thing that i hear often that doesn't make any sense <laughs> is that is oh if i brush it if i brush the football it gets shinier which means it's slippery mm. Or it gets squeakier, which means it's slippery, which is the opposite. Like it's shiny because it's getting stickier and it's squeaky because it's getting stickier. But it's just, it's just a... Get angry, Nick. I I'm want, not mad. I want angry, Nick. I mean, I, I, I want, I want that football to be exactly what that guy wants it to be. Okay. Whoever that guy is. Enough football. Nobody gives a shit about <laughs> listening to this cares. Uh, I want you to talk about... And I would also want to get to the other people you asked about, unless you already t- mentioned everybody. Uh, that you no, I want to. I want to ask you: Do you do you tell people to put stuff on their walls and belts? No, I, I mentioned that in this podcast. I already. I usually say like, "Hey, look, here's the proof that you shouldn't do anything." Is I sell these products, and I would love to take twenty five dollars from you. That sounds great, but you really shouldn't. Like, please don't buy this because you're going to find that it's got plenty of wax and oils tanned already inside of it that all you really need to do is brush it. And, and use it. Yeah, and, and well, yeah it's, that was the next point. It's like there is a natural polishing that happens that's very specific to a wallet in your pocket. So as you're walking, that thing is getting butt glazed all day <laughs> and it gets really nice. And actually, I, I think about this a lot and it's very self-serving to bring up in podcast, Nick, but I really think Cordovan is better suited for small leather goods than footwear for mm. you know what i'll take that back because i do think the lack of creasing on the toe of a shoe is is very unique for cordovan but there's something magical about just wearing that wallet in your pocket and watching it change without doing anything it i think that's special and it 
it's all, like, especially on like a light color cordovan, we're saying natural or whiskey, those lighter shades. It's like pretty special experience to you take a photo of it when you get it and then take a photo a year later. And you're like, man, that's, it's been on a journey. And sometimes that's valuable for me to look at because it, you know, we just had another birthday and I don't remember. We have the same birthday for people that are listening. Yeah. We have the same birthday, not like. <laughs> Happy birthday, everybody. <laughs> Happy but birthday. The crazy thing, man, is like, I don't remember what's happened over the last 365 days. It's like, I don't remember things because I'm not paying attention enough perhaps to things that matter and, and sort of observing that change in the leather or, you know, observing metaphorically changes in my life is probably served me better. So there's something special there that helps me milestone marker my life. And I, it's through the leather, which is very nerdy, super dorky, but there's something there. Dorky. There's something there though. It's special. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that, yeah, wallet is, it's so, a wallet is so individual. I mean, I guess that my recommendation to someone who like wants to, if someone like is thinking about, oh, I want to see what really good leather, you're going to love this. I want to see what really good leather does and looks like. You should start with a wallet hmm. because you're, and I think I've talked about this before, like your dollar per wear or like dollar per use in the case of a wallet goes down so fast because you, it, if it's a nice wallet and you like it and you carry it every day, I mean, it becomes, it becomes worth it. I mean, because you're using it every single day. I mean, it's a pair of shoes. If you wear a lot, that's great. You know, a pair of pants, whatever you, but you're not going to wear them every day, but the wallet, if you have one wallet that you fall in love with that you're going to use forever, I mean, you're going to have it forever and use it every day. So all of a sudden spending, you know, $500 on a wallet, a wallet might seem like a lot like at the beginning, but it's not, not if it's going to last forever. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a slippery slope too. The other thing I caution people about is like, again, like I would love to take your money, um, but like we sell your Cordovan, you give us crazy finishes in different colors and there's different styles that we offer and people end up collecting these things. And some of the guys I'm like, man, thank you so much for supporting us, but like, why don't you just wear that natural shell one for what a month doing? or like you're the worst salesman I've ever heard. No, but it's like, it's true. <laughs> like part of the reason we, we make this stuff is for it to be worn. So it, it does feel, yeah. it feels it's like great because we're able to do the things we do and people support it. But at the same time, it, it does feel, it, it feels to be not part of the, the goal for me, but I'm not the customer. Right. But like, we really want to see that leather transform and change. I think that's part of the, the cool part about it and and again with the wallet and talking about leather care that's the coolest thing you don't have to do anything you just wear it right so i i tell people uh here's a here's a good tip wallets uh two things you'll notice on a bifold wallet or anything that closes together that has credit cards inside and then you put it in your pocket will accumulate dirt dust on the inside so usually like if you really want to baby it and make sure the inside doesn't get scratched you're going to want to do two things. Flip your cards backwards so the numbers and letters on the face of those cards don't push out the leather. And especially on Cordovan, when that wallet closes and you sit on it, it kind of smushes around. And the Cordovan is microscopically abrasive and will scratch itself, especially where those numbers and letters are, are pushed out. And you'll start to see these little bits of lines uh, where those numbers are. You can minimize that to some extent by flipping your cards backwards. But the other thing that's happening in there is the dust and dirt. If, if you're able to sort of damp cloth, wipe it down, brush it once a week, every day, whatever you want to do, depends on how severe you want to be, you can retain that like new appearance on the inside of the wallet much longer. Those, those are like really the only things I suggest to people. And then, you know, hey, I, I, I sort of neglected this thing. It's got some scratches on the inside. I usually don't you're never really going to get it back to where it was. Like once that, that Corvin is, is abraded to a certain extent, you can't really get it back fully. So it will always sort of appear that way. You can improve it slightly with severe Corvin cream. So I'll suggest that sometimes or the Venetian shoe cream, if they already own it, so they don't have to buy something else. But what I really love is reverse Corvin on the insides of wallets because you 
you get your Cordovan smell, you get that unique appearance of the reverse side of the shell with all the drip marks, sometimes the ink stamp. But that reverse side is much more easily filled in and polished in if you were to neglect it to an extent. So you can apply more polishes to fill in the grain side of the shell um, more easily than the shell side. So that's one reason I recommend people do a reverse interior uh, for a wallet. It's funny that you said the, the numbers thing. I've never, I have never thought to reverse my cards, but I've all, I guess subconsciously, I, cause you know, it's like some of the cards, credit cards now are like those, the metal cards that don't have the raised numbers. And I just realized that both of my bottom cards are smooth and don't have numbers on them. Are you so seeing? I don't have the scratching. No. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah. It's almost I guess like if you I were like a real, if you were like a real psycho, you could, you could like put a bandana like in your wallet. You could. Like you know, six months and carry around like a, that. Have you ever seen a um like a a, a wallet for like a police badge? Mm -hmm. They have they often have like little. They're like new buck type of or like suede little flaps that cover them. I've, I've thought about developing a wallet with that, but it's like, I just don't want to put more stuff in there. It's like, makes it I thick and like another thing to mess with. But yeah, in theory, you could put some insert or something in between that would just prevent it from scratching. You're right. Yeah. I, I wouldn't think, go through the trouble. Just just embrace it. It's good at this leather. It's Those scratches are from your numbers on your cards. No one else has them. Just go with it. We released a new wallet today. Did you see nice. that? It's, no. called, it's called the Lucky Wallet. Let me look. Okay. You should pre-order one, Nick. <laughs> Buy my stuff, Nick. Uh, it seems like, you know, just put it up a couple hours ago and it's like a lot of people. Like, I'm looking lucky at a screen wallet, here of people see. buying lucky wallets. It's like out of control. So just is just under like men's wallets. Let's see here. No, it's on the private stock page right now. Oh. But the interesting thing about that oh, is... A lucky wallet. I see it that's one that doesn't fold in half. So if, if you're looking for something that's going to retain its appearance, maybe look into the lucky wallet that we sell. Uh, if you're trying to not support me, <laughs> you can look in, into wallets that just don't fold. There's like card holders that have slots and, and things like that will, will retain that appearance longer. Um, but generally speaking, bifolds or anything that's going to rub against itself, especially in your pocket as you sit on it, is going to kind of smush in there and, and not look as yeah. great. You should buy one, Nick. Try it out. Uh, Try it out. Uh, there's yeah, a couple. There's so many. So personal preference runs so deep on the wallet stuff. I just think that just find something you like and just go with it. I think that I think that with I think with leather, especially leather that's more natural, that from piece to piece, that there's enough variation that I still I think it's interesting to still have different different wallets of like the same thing. I mean, cause you get like with Cordovan, like you get different thicknesses and you'll get a different, a slightly different experience carrying a wallet with like a thick outer layer than a thinner one. And I just think it's, it's fun. It's fun to have a, a, a different stuff to pick from. I kind of missed what you were, the point you were trying to make there. You said a wallet made without different things. You no, know, with, so like if, um, because, you know, this, in the shell, if we're talking about wallets and shells, and I think we're like way off the leather care stuff right now, but that's okay. We can delete uh, all this. <laughs> no, it's fine. The, you know, like the the thicker, you know, as you go up on the shell, it gets thicker. So if you make a wall, a shell, a wallet out of shells, that's all from the thicker part of the piece. You end up with a different experience than if you were to make a wallet that's all with the thinner parts. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like I think that there's a combination that I like, but I know plenty of people that like like a really chunky wallet. Mm -hmm. Like they want all thick stuff, or some people like like want something that's like really refined and thin. They want all thin stuff. So I I think that it's interesting because you can't really, it's it's almost impossible to say like to make them all the same way all the time. So you can get two wallets that are made you know a few months apart, and they're I I still think that they'll be different enough in that case that it could be interesting to to carry different wallets or different colors even if it's the same wallet to some extent i think it's personal preference but i'm such a snob and asshole that i have i'm very particular about wallet thicknesses so i'll go on a quick tangent that 
I think they're the, we've done a lot of work thinking about thicknesses for, for Ashland leather. So the things that we're cutting are cut very specifically out of four different, sometimes five different thicknesses of leather that we purchase from, from Nick. So we prescribe those five different thicknesses and then use them in different ways for different patterns and different styles that we make. And they're very thoughtfully considered. So you're right, there is a balance to thickness, but I think the, the challenge that I end up having is there's a general consensus that people think thicker leather is better. Reference the last episode we put out with Rose Anvil. Uh, in my experience, that is not the case. You can have strong, resilient, long lasting leather that is thin, and you can have really crap, wimpy, weak, thick leather that's going to break. The, the thickness is less important than the, than the tannage and how those fibers are, are bound together from a tannery. Um, so for me on a wallet, I actually prefer thinner most times, but there is such a thing as too thin. So again, like we've gone through the work and thought about the balance between thick and thin on a very traditional bifold we call it Johnny the Fox, has a bill slot in the back, six card holders on the inside, two hidden slots underneath. It's like what most men envision a bifold wallet looks like. I like very specifically a four ounce leather for the outside of the wallet. That's one, is that 1.6? 1.6 millimeters thick. And then the inside pattern pieces, because there's so many layers stacked on top of each other. Here's, here's a little inside manufacturing scoop. We prescribe two and a half ounce leather for the inside of that. I'm actually not sure what the millimeter is there, Nick. Help me out. Is that two? What you saying? 2.5 ounce. Uh, one, like one. So it's one, right. like one millimeter thick for the inside and 1.6 for the outside. So we're using thinner leather on the interior because there's more layers of leather stacked on top of each other. And then when it closes together, it's even further thick. So it, it sort of like pooches out <laughs> in the center where more layers are stacked on top of each other in, in an unpleasant way. So the thinner we can get on the inside while purchasing leather that's still strong, the, the better. What a lot of places do is they don't buy multiple thicknesses from a tannery. Instead, they will skive the outside edges of the wallet. So it, it sort of tapers and, and bevels down towards the edges, which is nice and it's beautiful. And I think it's really refined and well done. The problem is, is thinning down the leather, especially in those spots, really like severely compromises the strength of the leather, especially when you're starting with something that's kind of thin. If you start with four ounce leather and you thin it down to two and a half ounce, you're going to reduce the, the strength of the leather significantly, which is why we get a lot of customers that come in with a wallet that says, hey, this thing broke in half, or not broken half. We get a lot of customers that come in and they go, hey, this thing is just ripped on all the corners. And it's exactly for the reason I'm describing is manufacturers thin down the leather on the edges. So it's, it's not about the leather itself. Uh, it, it's about reducing uh, the leather after it, like its natural state. So that's very important for like durability and somebody that wants something that's going to last is like try to just start with a product that was considered. Um, and, you know, I think most people listening to this kind of already know the footwear people that are great at this. And these days there's like a lot of great people to choose from. Um, so the proof's in the pudding, right? Like look at photos of 10 year old pairs of blank and see how they've held up. That's probably an indicator of, of how well considered the, the design of those products are. And I know it's not necessarily about like leather care and polishing, but maybe even more important, <laughs> like just start off with a good thing. Like, yeah, I mean, there's, it, it's much more rewarding to, to, or I think it is to take care of something that's well-made. If you're going to spend all the time, it's going to, you're going to be able to enjoy it I don't and know, like, have it change instead of instead of take care of it for you know two years and then it falls apart but here's something revealing I have a, how much do iPhones got it's like thousand plus dollar iPhone I don't do anything to take care I don't even have a case on it you're insane what is wrong with me everybody like <laughs> I, I, I I think it happens once a week where I go somewhere and people are like whoa you're crazy and I'm like what do you what do you mean oh you don't have a case on your phone but dude I've had this for two years it's fine. I congratulations. I would. <laughs> I've dropped my. I dropped my phone today. I mean, I just drop my phone all the time. Is it broken? I have two. I have two. No. What's? Well, I have a case on it, so it's fine. I have two. I have a four year old and an eight year old boy. It's like. Oh yeah. They get like, 
It's just gets, I just don't give my a, kid my phone. A shout That's out another to, leather to, uh, care tip. To who made that? Nomad. Dude. Brian. Uh, remember last time he was on? Brian. Yeah. Last time he was on. This is it. We're going deep on the tangents. This is worth sharing. Last time he was on, um, I showed you this heavy um, yep. I base station thing. This is their new one. It's even better. And they built in the thing that I wanted. I didn't even tell them this. I'm sure they were just getting natural organic feedback. So you pop your phone on this white circle. It's a MagSafe charger. You put your watch on the smaller circle. And then behind it, you put your AirPods. So it does all three. It's perfect. I really nice. like this thing. So um, thanks, Brian from Nomad. Hopefully you, he'll never listen to this. Probably not. <laughs> but I really, he's too, he's got, I really like he's that too. too. He's too big. He's too big time for us. He's big time. It was very nice to come on his, come on this in. I've, I have a time. question I've had queued up for like 30 minutes here. Um, tell me about Deerbone Ebony Sticks. Do you ever play with those? A little. I think that, first of all, <laughs> are those all Deerbones? Are we sure they're I'm, all? I have no idea. I know that they're Deerbones. greasy. I, yeah. The ones I've seen are greasy. Because they are all, I'm being cynical, they're all like, they all look exactly the same. I have a feeling at the very least they get them and they like clean them up and shape them to make them, to make them all that How size and shape. Like what? Would, would a human pick a bone like from human to human? Wouldn't it be kind of similar or like any animal? I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. You're just too cynical. It, yeah, it works. I mean, they work. But I think it's more of a function of it just being a smooth. I mean, I I don't use a earbud. I use a spoon. Like I just use a a metal spoon because I can put my thing, my thumb like in like the dish of the spoon, and you can build up some heat by move. You know, you can actually build up like too much heat to a certain point. Um, but I just like I just I just you can you can put more pressure on that way. Also, you always have spoons. Like you don't always have like a the shin bone of a dough in your like drawer <laughs> but if it, like, this is this goes back to the beginning like if it works for you and you like the result then just use it i mean it's not it's not a recommendation that's out there in the world because it doesn't work or it's because it's you know but i think i think that i think that there are alternatives that are just as um effective to me at least yeah. but i would i would still say try it get one and try it yeah, actually, I think that's, you know, I think that's part of the fun. It with, um, especially with the footwear, is they're they're not disposable, but they're not as permanent as other things in life. So it's fun to wear the stuff, polish it, sort of have your experience with it that is satisfying and joyful, or can be. I found it pretty relaxing to brush a boot. As stupid as that sounds, my wife would punch me if she heard me say that just because it's like seems so corny <laughs> i think but that there's something there it's fun yeah i think that and i think you said this earlier is that it's the stuff is pretty resilient a good piece of leather no matter who makes it is pretty resilient um i mean it depends on what on how it's made and how it's treated but you can do a lot to a piece of leather before it starts to before you start to have issues with it unless you're doing something you know, ridiculous, you know, putting in the oven or something. But, um, I mean, we used to, and I think I may have told this on, the, on here before we, we made a leather a long time ago, a long time ago. And it, to make it waterproof, they were taking rubber pellets and dissolving <laughs> the rubber pellets in gasoline. Yes. <laughs> and then dipping the leather in the gasoline and then like drying it hanging it up to dry. And then, you know, when the, when the gas would evaporate off, it would, the rubber would be on the leather. So it would be like, you'd be like kind of like rubberizing the leather, which is a terrible idea. That's I mean, there's so many, such better ways. In industrial there story are that you have. such <laughs> better ways. For so many reasons, there are better ways to do that. But I mean, I can't think of anything like more, uh, that would be harder because it, you know, it, it's such a solvent. It dries, dries super fast. It's really, it dries, it's going to dry out the leather and you're putting a rubber on it. And it, 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 it gives you a desirable result in that case, at least for the use case. But 
So anyway, that's that's all to say. I think that as long as you're using a good quality leather conditioner and you're not going crazy, you're not really going to hurt the leather. You might change the color. So, I mean, be, be aware of that. Like, you know, sure. apply a little bit in a spot that maybe isn't super conspicuous, like on the inside heel or like in the gusset or on the tongue or something. But um, a note on that, that people should be aware of, especially if you've never done it before, but the color, if especially if you start with a light shade, say natural cordovan, natural anything, any material you put on there, including water, will darken it initially, but let it, you know, let it dry out before you make your assessment on how much that will darken the material. Yeah. Good. Sorry, Good sorry to interrupt you there. <laughs> no, it's fine. No, I, I was, I didn't, I didn't really have an end to that idea. So I'm glad you did. Yeah. What else did we not cover? Is that the uh -huh. ultimate guide? Or just ultimate I don't think rambling. We really give anybody a guide to anything. I yeah. think that people are going to be more confused after this, but that's okay. I think that's we should name the show like the ultimate confusion guide to leather care. Or, or we tend to do it's that more every like, episode, uh, like meditations on shoe care. It's like not really. You know what the real hope I had before we recorded today was just conversation about these topics. I think will be helpful because again, there's no answers, but it is interesting to hear people's experience so like you tell me about your yeah. grandfather's it's kind of fun um and other brands who else did did you speak to anybody else that we neglected to talk about um no i mean i just i did a lot bunch of poking around i didn't i think that's i mean i'd like to get i would like to put up a leather care guide on on my site just because the it's a, it's a common enough question i think it'd be good to have something out there mm -hmm. um so I'll work. I mean, I, that's sort of been like a, a years long goal though. I've never, and also like an FAQ because a lot of the, a lot of the questions come up pretty often. Um, yeah, no, I can't think of, I think that, yeah, it just goes back to doing what you want. I think that this, I don't have a ton of experience with like a really, really hard, like a spit shine almost. And I think that that's interesting. Like that's like its own kind of skill. Like the patience, and then they use the like the paste waxes, like the hard waxes, and then you get like that really hard shine on the toe. Mm -hmm. And I think on certain shoes, that that's a really nice. That looks really nice. I I know there's a community of people that do that, and we should find them and get them on here. Talk yeah. to a couple of people. Let's do that. You can do it. It's not that. I mean, you can even with like Venetian cream, like you can get you can get a harder shine out of that if you use like a little bit of water. So like you put the Venetian cream on and then like put like a tiny bit of water and brush it and then put a little more Venetian cream and then put brush it and then you just like build up the layers, but then you're, you're setting yourself up for, you know, waxes getting caked on there and stuff. But, um, which is why I think that the, that mirror shine you usually see like on the very toe, because you're not getting, you don't get that flexion and you don't get the, the issues that you get with the, with the waxes building up in the creases as much. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Well, no, it'd be interesting to have, I mean, there are people like the, like the people that are like really expert at building a patina on like a finished shoe. Yeah. Um, There's competitions for it. Them. Yeah. They didn't yeah. uh, stitch on whatever, um, what's the event they did <laughs> called? Damn. I feel so bad for not remembering what it's called, but they had that competition, uh, there at whatever that stitch on event was. Oh, boot like who camp. Could make it? it was called boot camp to like p to patina a finished shoe. Yes, interesting. I did not know that. I was spying on them because I didn't make it this year. I think I'm going to go 2024. By the way, and, and and I spoke to Ben. I'd like to have him on to to sell us on going and make us want to go. Nick, while well, I have you here, and by the way, thanks thanks for doing another episode. Um, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, man, it's so fun. Um, honestly, like. This was the easiest, most relaxing part of my day. Me too. <laughs> By like a Actually. lot. <laughs> uh, while I have you here, and we'll cut this out if it's not possible, do you want to schedule a live stream for the next episode? And, yeah. You know, announce this right now to everybody, and then I'll sure. schedule it on our YouTube. What days are good for you, man? You want to do another evening? Yeah. How about? How about same time next week? Yes. All right. Wednesday, the 17th of January, we're going to be doing a live Q&A. 
This is the first I'm hearing about it, which means it's for sure the first you're hearing about it. Should we do 8 yeah, p.m. Definitely. Central? Yes. All right, man. Well, everybody, uh, thanks for being here for today's episode. If you're uh, watching on YouTube and you haven't paid any money, hit the, uh, <laughs> hit the subscribe button, I guess. Or if you paid money, you don't have to press it. Um, and everybody listening on Apple Music, Spotify, thank you guys just for listening to us ramble, perhaps a little bit too many tangents today, but uh, I thought there's some I good like stuff it. here. Yeah, and then but we'll the, see you guys, everybody, next week on the 17th of January here. That's uh, Wednesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. We'll put up an event, or I will put it up as soon as I turn the camera off here. I'll put up an event on our YouTube. Um, people can watch there, and we'll do a live q and it's been like it's been like three weeks. What you must have a, a new favorite. I think oh, you want to do favorites? Going. Yeah, let's do it, dude. Um, it's actually been more than three weeks um, because I think the last episode that I edited, I was in Mexico on vacation editing that video with Weston. So Mexico was cool, man. It's we've been so busy at work. I, I think my favorite is going to be Christmas time. <laughs> And honestly, like, I am not a religious person, and I've sort of been resistant to Christmas for so many years for that reason. Because it's like, hey, it's like kind of not my thing. Like, I'm not, I don't do any of it. Hanukkah, Christmas, Easter, like, none of it. But there is, I'm seeing immense value from celebrating even things that I'm not a part of with my my two year old daughter, and she loves Christmas. She loves the lights, and it's sort of re. It, 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 I don't know. It's reignited that like childhood, like joy that you know everybody, perhaps many people have had when they were kids, like you know, that time of year. So I got a lot of that again, and it's thanks to my daughter. So maybe my favorite is my daughter. That was a sweet way of saying I love my daughter. <laughs> But Christmas nice. is fun. It was, it was fun this year, man. I haven't had a holiday season like that in a long time because, you know, usually we're so busy at work. It's every day is a long day and holidays for an, you know a business that sells gifts is a different experience than somebody that doesn't. You know, like I work more, not less during the holidays. Yeah. Um, but I, I made an effort to, uh, to do more Christmassy things with her. So you got a favorite? Good. No. I just want to hear what you had to say. All right, cool, man. <laughs> no, I actually have a question for you. It's not a favorite, but um what do you do as a as a musician or as a as a in general if you get into like a cre- or like a creative slump? Because like I've been and I'm asking for a friend, but I've been <laughs> in like a like with because I do a lot of photography or I try to. For I got you general because I like it, but also because you know to inside the the tannery and stuff to post, and I've just been finding that I don't really I, I'm just not like into it. It's not it's not like I don't I don't know I don't I, I'm trying to like reignite the spark and I can't I can't figure out how to do it. And I also I'm I'm looking at some of the stuff I I've the pictures that I've taken in the past and I feel like they're all like not good. Yeah, so I'm wondering. So, I have a feeling that you you may have gone through that with like music or photography or something. Oh, all of that is. I'm like you're like right on the money with everything there. Um, I would say the first thing is space. Like, you don't have to do photography. Just like don't do it. Just like you need to get a distance from it until it feels fun. Just like this podcast, man. Like this was this would be terrible to listen to. And terrible for us to do if we hated doing it. It's like you don't want to force it. Just take some space from it and like let it happen when it when it needs to happen. And I think that's one. I think if you are in the mindset of like, hey, I want to work on this thing, I, I like Jerry Seinfeld's method of. He, I think he calls it "don't break the chain." So if it's photography that you want to work on, hey, take one photo a day and exit on the calendar. And eventually, if you do that every day, your calendar is going to start to look like a chain of X's. Don't break the chain. Just like keep it going. I don't know if that's where you're at right now. Uh, the other thing is, if you're looking back at your creative output and it's better than what you're doing today, that would be surprising. If it's worse than you see today, that's great news. 
So I think you should feel good seeing your old work and being able to criticize it in like a productive, like not self-hating way, right? Like I purposefully leave up all my old YouTube things that I think are very cringeworthy and terrible because it's fun to go back to it and like look how, how far I've gone. And it's also like a moment in time. There's something there where uh, this is very corny, but like I was listening to a podcast today. It was an interview with a musician and it was the bass player for Prince. She was talking about how Prince would not like to overdub or re-record any of the initial performances for his records because there is a certain amount of magic to capturing a thing in the moment that is not overly corrected or to correct it in any extent. And it's interesting and like more pertinent today because we have AI that can be perfect and pristine, but it's unrelatable because it's so perfect. So th I think there's some value in seeing things in that new lens of like, hey, that old stuff, I see some problems there, but that's what make it, makes it human. And that's what makes it unique. And that's what makes it Nick Horwing. So maybe think of it in that lens instead would be my suggestion. But I'm man, I'm there right now. Like I've got all these instruments behind me. I have so many creative outlets and things that I love to do, but I get drained from that bucket of energy. And honestly, like most of that energy goes towards working at Ashwin Leather Company, creating things there. So it's, it's a little bit of a shame because I love like this podcast is sort of that same well of energy playing the instruments and playing in the band is that also that same well of energy. And like, I don't have 20 hours a day of energy for that. I probably have like 10, which is still like a lot. And I'm probably doing yeah. like 12. <laughs> so I'm like deficient on uh, creative energy. And, and then that's when I have to go like, just stop. Like, why are you trying to do more than you can? Just let yourself be what you are and try to not control it, you know? I don't know if that's helpful, but just leave the photo stuff alone. Or if you're looking for inspiration, sometimes I notice like renting a different piece of gear. It doesn't sound like yeah. you're looking for inspiration. It looks like, it sounds like you just darn enjoying it. Yeah, I don't know what, I, I just like, I don't, I don't know. It's a, uh, I have so many, like I really like cameras and I have so many like awesome cameras and I've been trying to like, just like, just grab a different camera and just like put it on my shoulder and see if that is just like not, it's just not. Shouldn't that be okay? Right. I think it, yeah, it is okay. Yeah. No, I just, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice outlet though. Like it's nice. Cause a lot of what I'm doing is film now. So it's, cause it, so it's a very deliberate slow process. And then it's, it's like delayed gratification where you take the picture and then you send it out and then it takes, you know, by the time you, from when you take the picture to when you actually get to see it, I mean, it's like, let's it, say at least two weeks, probably. If you send it out like the same day you take it, maybe. Right. But, uh, yes, yeah, so maybe, maybe that's it. I don't know. Maybe it's too, maybe it's not, maybe I need something more instant, but. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's, you know, sometimes I've noticed too, it's like other things that aren't related to that subject that are sort of like, toxic to other parts of your life so like if there is some other activity that's like not happening in the way you want it like it could be affecting like your photography experience because it's all like at least in my experience of the creative stuff kind of all affects everything it's like you really so you could be affected by something else that's now further affecting the photography i don't yep. know i don't know <laughs> i don't have the answers nick no i just was curious because you're a creative person so i just didn't and I, I see like some of the, like on Instagram, some of the photographers that I follow, like they just seem to have, and I mean, this is like, this is the image they put out there, but they seem to have such like a, a well of enthusiasm for what they do. You but, should know that as a guy that has to take photos for a job and take videos for a job to like pay for my mortgage, sometimes you have to force it, but you're yeah. in a position where you're like, you're not reliant on a photo to pay for your food today. Right. So maybe that's the right. difference. It's like you, you should know that I, there's many days where I'm just like, I don't feel ready to do this video and put my face on a camera right now. Like I'm not comfortable and I don't want to do it, 
but I have to. So I just force myself to do it. And at the end of it, I look back during the edit and I'm like, it was fine. It's like, it's like, yeah. it, it is a weird, just mental block on things. Yeah. Yeah. I was watching, and he's like super famous, but a uh, photographer named Jimmy Nelson, you ever heard of him? I, he does like familiar. very, very deliberate, very composed, like, cultural like portraiture kind of stuff and it's all very it's all very like deliberate but he's so enthusiastic about his work it's great i mean it's it's very it's, it's very admirable i mean also his pictures are like check them out after this but they're like unbelievable yeah use them for inspiration but you don't need to be him right like oh no there's not. no i mean it's just like it's so it's it's yeah i would say i <laughs> What calling what I do photography next to what he does is like, <laughs> is, uh, I don't know. You do not a fair you, comparison. You're not doing like studio. You're not doing composition with the lighting. Uh, you, you're not controlling the light directly other than the angle of like the sun or the window. Right. You're, you're capturing a moment or like a, you know, um, composition in the frame. Yeah. And not a lot of those photographers, the next level from where you're at is like getting extra lights and having a ton of like a light crew and like a team yeah. of lighter people. <laughs> well, this guy, I guess one of the reasons I like this guy is that a lot of his stuff is outdoors. And I'm sure, I'm sure in some of the stuff he's got, he's like got bounces and he's manipulating the light. But a lot of it, I think, is probably just the weather and the time of day. And he probably, you know, has the, the luxury to like take pictures at certain times of year, you know, certain times of day um, to make sure to get the results that he wants. But yeah, I know what you're saying. It's just like the shoes, like what's your goal, right? You, if the goal is just to have fun, then don't do it if it's not fun. Would be my advice. Yeah, that is the goal. I guess that's the goal. I mean, it's not like um, I work for National Geographic or anything mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, it should be fun. All right, man. Well, uh, this is probably a good time to stop. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, man. Thanks for uh, ending. Uh, maybe the new end of the show won't be favorites. It'd be like mini coachy therapy sessions for each other. I felt like I feel like this was a meditative enough show that I could I could ask like a, yeah, I love another it, reflective question. Okay. Well, everybody, we'll see you next week on Wednesday, the seventeenth, eight o'clock central. See you on YouTube. Thanks, Nick. Bye. And we'll see you later.